Welcome back to the final keynote um, of the conference um, with Oliver Letwin, who's here with me on my left. Um, there is a Discord thread open, as with all the keynotes, so please um, use that to have a discussion and also to add your questions separately so that we can ask them to Oliver after he speaks. Um, I was just saying that this is a great bookend to the conference with Martin Rees's speech on the first day, because in Oliver's talk on planning for catastrophe, why resilience equals fallback, we have again this term resilience that has become almost a hashtag in our media in the last year or so that Martin so eloquently um, put in, I'm going to, have to be careful how I put this now that you're in the room, <laughs> put this in opposition with the term um, efficiency in his talk on the first day and explain that often these things pull us in different directions. And I feel like that's a theme we'll come back to a little bit today perhaps from a different perspective. Um, so Oliver Letwin may need no introduction for some of you, um, but just a little bit on where he is today. So um, Oliver w was an academic at Cambridge um, and a civil servant um, and a director um, at Rothschild, but he's now currently a visiting professor at King's College London, where he chairs the Project for Peaceful Competition and is a vice president of the Great Britain China Centre. He's also an advisory council on the advisory council for the Bennett Institute for Public Policy at Cambridge, whose conference is tomorrow, if any of you <laughs> are staying around. Um, and we're very glad to have him with us today um, to speak for about 30, 40 minutes and then and take some questions from our team. Thank you, Oliver. Over to you. Thank you. Um, uh, and um, thank you all, and hello to those uh, online. Um, uh, I, I should explain that um, the reason I think I was asked to give this talk is, is not any of the uh, bits of bio that um, you mentioned, but the fact that in the middle of all of that, I found myself um, uh, helping to, uh, to run a government, uh, and um, uh, I was the Minister for Resilience, so-called, um, and had responsibility in the National Security Council for trying to improve our resilience and came to certain uh, conclusions and um, uh, uh, also formed in my mind certain concerns about the way in which we and other countries do these things, which led me to write a book um, which uh, um, is called Apocalypse How uh, and is not a particularly happy book, um, uh, in which I was helped, among other things, by uh, Martin Rees, um, uh, which is why I accepted to come to this uh, talk because I felt I owed it to Martin to, to be here for his center, which, whose existence I very much welcome. Um, uh, now, you, you have the advantage over me because you've heard um, many learned uh, talks, and I don't know what was said in them. Um, uh, but I'm going to restrict myself to uh, challenging four misconceptions. Uh, now, it may be that nobody in this room and nobody watching online suffers from any of these misconceptions, in which case uh, I apologize for uh, teaching grandmothers, um, but I am then going to advance two positive uh, propositions, and it may, of course, be that you already accept these two propositions, in which case I further apologize, but I'd be more surprised if you already accepted the propositions than if you uh, didn't suffer from the misconceptions. Um, but I should say that the, the misconceptions that I'm going to address are very widespread. I think, I think most policymakers and most political commentators and most journalists uh, and uh, most people who have to do with administration in most countries suffer from all four of these misconceptions most of the time, uh, mainly unconsciously. Um, the, the first misconception I want to address is that um, causes of catastrophe are to some degree or other seriously predictable. Um, uh, the reason I, I uh, want to attack this misconception first is that a great deal of the problems that we face, I think, in establishing resilience stem from that misconception. People think uh, that they can roughly sketch the causes of catastrophe which they are likely to be faced with. Um, how do I know this? Uh, well, um, th there's a... A, a sort of industry uh, fomented by governments around the world. Um, uh, amongst the leaders in this industry are the UK, um, but there are, there are other countries that have followed suit and others that were roughly working in parallel. And it's regarded as a, a sign of being a leader in this industry uh, that uh, your government has 
uh, something like a risk register and that it uh, assesses risk. And in fact, if it's at all sophisticated, it will produce a matrix. And uh, on the y-axis of this matrix uh, will be impact, and on the x-axis will be likelihood, or vice versa. And uh, uh, having then assessed all the risks, uh, they are charted on this matrix. And those that appear in the top right and have a relatively high likelihood and uh, a relatively large impact are those which the governments in question then go about trying to uh, prepare for and be resilient against. Um, now, if you ask yourself, what is the assumption on which this vast international, increasing <coughs> international industry is based? It's the assumption that someone knows how to plot risks on such a chart because they can, roughly speaking, predict what the risks are. And there'd be no point in having this sort of chart if you didn't make that sort of assumption. Uh, and, uh, and of course, some risks are reasonably predictable. Um, so some of those which are reasonably predictable are not really very interesting. Um, uh, I, I'm probably the person in this room least equipped uh, to make this uh, scientific observation. Um, and there are some people, including Martin, in this room who are amongst the people in the world most equipped to make this observation. But I believe it to be the case that it will certainly, or almost certainly, be the case that eventually the Earth will be swallowed up by the sun. Um, this is really not very interesting for policymakers because um, there's now we can do about it at any rate at the current state of affairs. So you'll be interested to know that this highly predictable risk does not appear on the national risk register. Well, you probably everyone in the room already knows that. And there are good reasons there's nothing we can do about it. Um, uh, but, um, uh, but you might think that amongst those risks that are interesting, uh, uh, history would show that we're pretty good at predicting which things we should worry about and that they would therefore appear in the risk register. Well, history shows the exact opposite. Um, uh, we've just been through uh, COVID-19, uh, and as everyone in this room, I'm sure, perfectly well knows, uh, COVID-19, or indeed a respiratory disease rather like COVID-19, SARS, MERS, uh, were not high up on the risk register. In fact, they didn't appear in the risk register. What appeared in the risk register in their place was pandemic flu, which was right at the top right. Uh, it was the, the very thing which we were most concerned about preparing for. Um, uh, but it had different characteristics from COVID. Uh, uh, that isn't the whole explanation, because we also weren't well prepared for it, as it turns out. But park that. The main point was it was the wrong disease. Um, and, uh, and huge efforts were made to prepare for dealing with this wrong disease, uh, because nobody predicted the disease we would actually be afflicted with. And uh, that's just a one tiny example amongst many, many uh, of, uh, of the fact that we're very bad at predicting what, what are the interesting things, things big enough to really worry about, but small enough to be doable, for it to be doable to do something about them. Uh, we're very bad at predicting those things in a way that would enable us actually to compile a risk register. Now, incidentally, I don't want any of what I'm saying to be taken to mean that we shouldn't do risk registers and that we shouldn't worry about preparing for the things we can predict uh, that are large enough to worry about and not so large we can't do anything about them. We should, uh, but we shouldn't delude ourselves that actually, having done that, we've done the job because it's extremely likely that something will come along that is in this category uh, that we won't have prepared for, that we won't specifically know about. I will deal later on with what I think we can do in the light of that degree of lack of predictability. But unless you recognize the lack of predictability, you can't take the steps necessary to deal with it. The second misconception I want to deal with flows directly from that. Um, uh, uh, even where you have predicted that something might happen that is in the category of being uh, important enough to worry about but not so devastating that uh, you can't do anything about it, um, uh, you can't be sure that the measures you take will prevent the thing that you're trying to prevent from occurring. I call this misconception um, the dikes will hold. Um, uh, there's a very good reason why everyone thinks the dikes will hold inside most 
uh, governments. Uh, that is their, their dikes. Um, by the time they've been there a little while, uh, politicians and administrators um, have a vested interest in assuming that whatever defenses they and their predecessors have built against whichever catastrophes they predict might happen uh, are good ones, because increasingly they're their responsibility. Um, and they don't want to go around thinking that they waste their time building defenses that don't work. Um, uh, I can tell you that as a democratic politician with you know, 30 years of experience of trying to persuade electorates at elections to vote for me, it, it is not a winning ticket to go and say that you've spent an awful lot of time designing defenses which very probably won't work. Um, this, is, this, is, uh, this isn't how politics works. And of course, in, in, uh, in more autocratic systems, as Mr. Putin has recently demonstrated, designing defenses or indeed offenses that don't work is a route to worse fates than not being elected. So uh, the truth is, in every system, every political system, one way or another, the people running the system acquire a vested interest in assuming that the dikes will hold when the flood comes. But actually, it's impossible to build defences that are foolproof. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm sure that the people in this room can think of a thousand examples of this without my needing to go through them boringly, but I'll just take one. Uh, uh, probably the single largest, and probably sensibly, the single largest uh, effort that is made to create defences uh, as opposed to mitigations by governments uh, today uh, around the world is in cyber defense. Uh, everybody is extremely concerned to make them, their own countries uh, foolproof uh, against a cyber attack, and for very good reasons. An enormous, a, a vast, unimaginably vast quantity of money is spent on this around the world, and um, uh, huge numbers of extraordinarily clever people are employed to uh, create these defenses, and uh, they don't work. I mean, that's not to say that they never work. They work hugely often. They, they work almost all the time. But unfortunately, they only have to be breached once, seriously, not to work. Um, and it is uh, impossible to be confident that your defences will work at the crucial moment. They might. You hope they will. It's worth investing in it. But you ought to accept not just that you can't predict certain risks that may come uh, uh, to pass, but also it's impossible to be confident that the defences you build against the risks you have predicted will hold on the night. The third misconception is deeper uh, and uh, even more widespread. Um, it's almost universal. Um, and uh, I've uh, found in having discussions with uh, politicians and administrators around the world about it over some years that uh, um, since leaving office, that, um, uh, that it, I'm normally regarded as, as mad uh, 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 when I uh, seek to attack this misconception, but it is just as bad a misconception as the other two. And this is the misconception that normality can be restored and that the aim of resilience should be to restore normality. Uh, I, uh, I have heard a, a, a whisper that uh, when you first addressed this uh, Conference, Martin, you, uh, you pointed out that efficiency and resilience are uh, often uh, uh, in contradiction to one another, and uh, this was mentioned right at the beginning of, of this session. Uh, and, and so they are, but in a very, very profound way. Um, the, the systems that we have, every kind of system, uh, IT systems, uh, systems of government, systems of operating businesses, social systems, uh, aim uh, one way or another uh, typically at a relevant kind, whatever is in that particular domain, a relevant kind of efficiency. Um, and they're bound to do that. Um, uh, uh, people want to optimize uh, whatever it is that they're seeking to optimize. And as they do so, they try and create systems that are efficient for getting to what they regard as optimal results in the relevant domain. So if you're running a supermarket chain, you want to make sure that you very efficiently uh, supply your supermarkets and very efficiently distribute 
to your customers the things that you have carefully accumulated through supply. And um, uh, uh, nothing is going to persuade you that you should be concerned about something other than optimizing in that way uh, for efficiency because, uh, well, to take that case, your stockholders will be very, very unhappy if they discover that your share price has gone down compared to the next supermarket because it's more efficient. Um, and this is just as true of governments. And in fact, while we're at it, it's just as true of voluntary bodies of various kinds. And so it doesn't matter whether we're talking about the commercial world or the political world or the voluntary world. In any world, there are, uh, there are the kinds of optimization that the people operating in that world want to achieve. And what they do is to design systems that are intended, at least, to be efficient in achieving those optimalities. Uh, and it's almost never efficient to worry about what will happen in the event that things stop working as normal. Um, uh, let me give you a, a very signal example of that. Uh, if you are running uh, one of the key uh, public service industries, so, for example, um, you're a mobile telephone operator or you're a, um, uh, the national grid in a particular country, um, uh, it, it, it is never worthwhile to diminish your day-to-day -day efficiency of operation for the sake of being able to deal with a crisis of uh, some days or weeks, uh, which may occur once every year, 10 years, 50 years. Um, because although the crisis may lead to mass uh, death uh, or gross inconvenience for millions, it doesn't lead to any significant diminution of your stock price uh, or of your profits. Um, if the national grid goes off for five days, which is what it will do if it goes down, because it takes five days to restore it, um, uh, the loss to the national grid in terms of revenue is five over 365 um, of that year's profits and five over 3,650 of that 10 years profits. Uh, and so it goes on, depending on the likelihood of the risk. Uh, and this is a tiny sum, whereas a, a minor improvement in day-to-day -day efficiency might very well lead over the same 10 years to uh, order of magnitude uh, improvements in uh, revenue by comparison. It never makes sense to invest in resilience uh, for the individual uh, company. Now, you may say, aha, this is, this is a, a, just a classic case of how markets fail us and why governments need to step in. And it is a classic case of why markets fail us and why governments need to step in and why there should be regulations about these things. But unfortunately, it's a big case also of um, who guards the guards because governments are susceptible to exactly the same logic. Um, if you're a politician or a, or a civil servant in any country and you worry, uh, quote, excessively, unquote, about uh, uh, being resilient and do not optimize day-to-day -day efficiencies, you will not be forgiven by your electorates who want day-to-day -day efficiency uh, and want low taxes and high expenditures and good hospitals and good roads and are not interested in being told that somewhere in a cupboard there's something that will prevent them from being as badly affected if something goes wrong which hasn't gone wrong. Um, I don't know how many of you ever tried to persuade a, a group of people anything, uh, of anything where it's critical to your own survival in, in, in professional life that you do persuade them. But believe me, as a politician, going around saying, don't worry, uh, this other party over here or this other administrator in an autocracy or whatever is, is telling you that they can improve your hospital and make sure that grandmother gets a hip replacement early. But I'm not concerned with that. I'm concerned with making sure that if there is an, a, a possibly unpredictable uh, health emergency, you will be better looked after under some future government than you would be if I didn't do this thing, which means your grandmother won't get her hip replaced early. Uh, believe me, this is not a saleable proposition, and governments don't do it either, and that's why uh, efficiency rules as an aim, uh, not, of course, the achievement always, but as an aim, and resilience doesn't, either in the commercial world or in the political world or anywhere else. Uh, um, 
And that means that the effort to restore normality, the idea that the way to be resilient is to make sure you can move back to business as normal immediately a risk materializes, is a grotesque misconception. The system has been optimized for efficiency, not resilience. And when it's brought down, for example, a cyber system that's brought down by a cyber attack, you can't restore it to the same efficiency uh, immediately. If you could, the risk would not be a serious risk. And you can't efficiently build another completely separate, equally good system because you would diminish the efficiency of the system that you are trying to optimize by taking half the money that you would have spent and spending it on the system which you're doing in parallel. You can't have it rationally as an aim to restore business as usual immediately you have dealt with the risk, even if uh, uh, you can predict the risk in the first place. Um, fourth misconception, which is very allied to the third, and is also almost universal. People are inclined to think that high tech beats low tech. And they're right when you're trying to optimize. If, if we had low tech systems of communications, uh, I wouldn't be able to talk to the audience that I'm talking to if they are listening online. Um, high tech is better than low tech for all sorts of purposes. But the purpose for which it is not better is being resilient. And the reason is that high tech typically suffers from exactly the problem that the system that's been optimized is going to suffer from when the risk comes along. You've optimized the system to deliver day to day. You've used the highest tech you could manage to optimize that system. The risk, if it materializes, prevents the normal operation of that system. And therefore, an equivalently high-tech system will probably suffer from the same risk in much the same way. So you can have a, a whole series of defenses, if, if you could afford them, which uh, exactly parallel the high-tech system you're trying to defend, and then discover to your horror that the, the attack, natural or human or whatever, that has got through the defenses of system A has, at, for the very same reasons, got through the systems B and C. Whereas typically, if you abandon the effort to restore normality and efficiency uh, as normal, and look instead to muddle through for a while, while you put the efficient systems back in place, you stand at least a chance of having a fallback arrangement that doesn't get hit by the same thing that has knocked over the system which has caused the need for the resilience. Uh, and typically that will be a low-tech system. Let me give you just one salient example. If there is a solar flare or something like it, uh, the world's satellite systems will uh, stop operating, uh, or some of them. And uh, therefore, uh, GPS and Galileo and the like won't work. Uh, Hilariously, governments in many parts of the world are seeking to solve this problem by having their own satellite systems that will provide uh, a fallback. Uh, not so hilariously, one of them is our government. <laughs> um, and uh, there's a problem, which is that the solar flare that afflicts the GPS will also knock out the satellites we put up to protect against this. Uh, now, there's uh, something which is a very unromantic it's a, it, and it, it, a much cheaper uh, and very old-fashioned and very low-tech and very suboptimal, I know, because I used to use them, and my wife and I used to have big arguments in the car on the basis of them. It's called a map. And, you know, she, she would sit there and read the map and I would drive, or vice versa, and it didn't actually matter which way around it was. We got very cross with one another because we're very bad at reading maps and we, you know, find it very difficult to get to the places we want to get to. And now it's miraculous because you turn on this machine and the machine tells you which direction to turn and you can have the conversation with your wife or your husband. It's all fine. But if the GPS goes off, I, I'm not going to embarrass anyone here, but how many people in this room actually have a map? How many children, well done, sir. How many children actually know how to read a map. Maps are low-tech. 
They're suboptimal. They're not efficient. They are very good as resilience. Uh, being resilient to solar flares and GPS, if we leave aside the problems of, uh, uh, of navigation on the seas and uh, of uh, timing for the City of London and its parallel organizations around the world in the financial system, if we leave those aside for a moment, just for the plain purpose of making sure that Mr. and Mrs. Jones can get to where they're trying to get to if the satellite system goes down, maps are it. They're brilliant. They're very low tech. Uh, and typically that's the case with proper resilience. Uh, low tech beats high tech when it comes to resilience. High tech beats low tech when it comes to the everyday, which is why we have it. So those are the four misconceptions that I think we need to clean away from our minds. They're very easy to fall back into. It takes a lot of effort, in my experience, to keep reminding yourself that we can't predict the causes of catastrophe. We can't assume that the dikes will hold. We shouldn't aim at restoring business as normal. And low tech beats high tech instead of vice versa when it comes to resilience. Uh, I now want to advance two propositions. Um, one is that in the light of what I've just said, resilience does not mean perfect defense against the disruption of business as normal, which is typically what people try to achieve in governments around the world, and indeed in companies around the world. What it means instead <coughs> is recognizing that you won't necessarily predict the risk, that even if you have predicted the risk, you can't be sure that your defenses will work, that you shouldn't be aiming at restoring normality, and that you want a low-tech solution which is wholly disengaged from whatever the system is that you're experiencing trouble with as a result of the risk having materialized so that you can make do and mend. And that's what I call a fallback solution, a low-tech uh, uh, method of operating that's sufficiently embedded and sufficiently practiced uh, and sufficiently workable under circumstances of the unknown risk materializing and your normal systems in some important way being utterly disrupted so that you have the ability to go on living more or less uh, uh, reasonably with as little as possible loss of life, damage to people's health and well-being and so on during a period when you're trying to put things back in order. And uh, 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 this, is, this is very unromantic stuff. Um, uh, I'll, I'll give you a, 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 an example from um, my own life. I live in a, in a Dorset village which has um, uh, two roads um, going into it and a uh, crossroads. Uh, 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 so there are four entries points and four exit points. And it's a long way from anywhere. Uh, I pretty much guarantee that anyone in this room or anyone listening who doesn't live in the same village won't have heard of it. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, Dorset Council does not have the funds and probably never will have the funds to uh, send out uh, uh, snow clearance lorries when the snow comes to this uh, obscure village. Um, uh, but when the snow comes, uh, or even it gets very icy, you can't get in and you can't get out because the roads are on hills and uh, they get blocked. And um, uh, this is a very minor risk and a very minor problem. But of course, you've got some old people living in the village and nobody can get in or out for a few days, actually one of these old people could die. So it's not tiny risk, it's a small risk because it's a small place, but it's a significant one proportionately. And the solution is of course to have a few farmers who uh, have uh, been given uh, a snowplow and can attach it to their tractors and to have some grit sitting around uh, so that when the Dorset Council is clearing the main roads, the village can do it for itself uh, in this unromantic way. This is a perfect fallback solution for a highly predictable risk. Uh, on the risk register, the chance that there's going to be snow in Thorncombe one year or other that blocks the roads is sky high. 
Uh, and the impact in terms of this tiny village is pretty significant too. So it's close to the top right of one of these risk registers. And the solution is not to, to, to build a whole set of different roads, which incidentally would also get snowed up, uh, nor, nor is it to invest in a fleet of high-tech helicopters. It's just to have some sand around and, 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 and some farmers with, with snowplows. This is the sort of thing which creates resilience. Does not prevent catastrophes, will not uh, uh, do the job that trying to take on uh, uh, carbon emissions or uh, trying to uh, provide defences for cyber attack and so on do, which is to try to prevent risks from materialising. Uh, but what it does do is to mean that when the risk actually materialises, you have a fallback which makes you resilient and therefore you don't have to worry. A low-tech, ever-present, fairly cheap resource, which incidentally is manifestly inefficient in the sense that the county council, or the Dorset council now is, is, is wasting, quote, some money maintaining these piles of grit around the place and making sure that the farmers know how to use the snowplow and uh, oiling it and so on, uh, which it could otherwise spend on optimizing the roads. Um, so there is a bit of inefficiency built in, but it's pretty minimal because it's a low tech, cheap solution. Fallback solutions are not efficient, but they are the right way, typically, of achieving resilience. And uh, uh, let me just mention that uh, we've just been through an experience where probably tens, maybe more than tens of thousands of lives just in this country could have been saved by an equivalent kind of thing. Uh, I see some people in this room are wearing masks. At the beginning of COVID, nobody would have been wearing a mask. There weren't any masks. Uh, 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 right at the top of the risk register, I remind you, top right-hand corner of the risk register in our country was pandemic flu. Pandemic flu is different from COVID, but it's similar in one respect, which is that although it can, as I understand it, be transmitted by direct contact or by uh, uh, viruses sitting on on uh, things you touch, uh, one of the main ways it gets transmitted is aerosol through the air. So you might have thought, might you not, that when we had a great uh, uh, um, exercise uh, to work through how to deal with pandemic flu, uh, in which literally thousands of people were involved, including the people running great ministries of state, that we, or indeed some other country that also had it at the top right of its register, might conceivably have thought it would be nifty to lay in a pile of masks. Not so, not done. Too low tech, too boring, too fallbackish, uh, too inefficient. Why, why do you need the masks? Uh, it, it, it might not happen. Um, but actually, we could have saved uh, probably, as I say, tens of thousands, maybe many tens of thousands of lives if we had simply had a large stock of masks at the beginning and known how to use them and known when it would make sense to use them. These are not death-defying propositions, but they don't happen because they're unromantic and people are looking for ways instead of doing romantic things like uh, working out how to prevent viruses from spreading or working out how to cure viruses or even, which was an enormous help, working out how to vaccinate against viruses. Um, but actually adding all those efforts to the simple fallback solution of having some masks around would have been an enormous benefit. Um, so my first proposition is resilience means fallback, fallback to easy, simple, inefficient, not business as normal, low-tech solutions that can get you by and help to ameliorate under circumstances where either you didn't predict the risk or it's got through your defenses. And the final point I want to make, the final proposition I want to advance is, this sounds incredibly easy, so you are probably thinking, why on earth doesn't it happen? And the answer is, it isn't easy at all. It's mind-numbingly difficult, mind-numbingly difficult to persuade either democracies or autocracies that they ought to bother about having resilience. Um, it just isn't interesting. Uh, Tony Blair um, uh, once charmingly when asked uh, about what he thought was the least sexy 
political utterance, said he could absolutely identify it, that if he made a speech in which he uttered the words further education, everyone listening would be asleep. And uh, I, uh, I think he's absolutely right. Uh, further education is probably one of the most important things that goes on in any country, and it is fantastically boring for most of the population. And all journalists, and uh, almost all politicians. But it's not half so boring as resilience. He was quite wrong that the most boring thing you can do as a politician is to witter on about resilience. Uh, and it is fantastically difficult to persuade uh, administrators to concern themselves with resilience. Uh, and uh, there are a legion of reasons for this, which I won't dwell on because I want to leave some time for uh, discussion in a moment. Uh, and I could occupy the next several hours describing the many reasons, but let me just give you one or two. The, the first reason is perhaps the most perverse. If you as an administrator or as a politician, or indeed while we're at it as a chief executive of a company or something, invest time and effort in getting people to be concerned about resilience, uh, and then build up fallback solutions, the worst fate that can befall you is that these actually prove to be necessary. You will not get plaudits at this point. On the contrary, you will be named as the very figure who's responsible for the fact that they weren't perfect. It's your responsibility. So much better if you can point to your predecessors and say they completely failed to give me a legacy of resilience. As soon as you invest in resilience yourself, you become responsible for making sure that the resilience, quote, works. And if what people are expecting is business as normal, and all the resilience does is to enable you to muddle through, you get absolutely no thanks at all. You just get brickbats. But in the meanwhile, you are spending your time talking about something which is incredibly boring and incredibly, in quotes, wasteful. And now I just draw your attention to the miracle of modern government brought about by William Ewart Gladstone in the 19th century in this country and replicated in almost every country on earth, which we call the Public Accounts Committee. Most awesome parliamentary device. On, only committee that permanent secretaries are afraid of. Only committee that ministers quake when they go before it. And what does it look at? It looks at efficiency. It looks at waste. So, uh, so, so, Minister, you have been responsible for establishing very large piles of salt sitting around. Why? Did we need the salt this year? No. Did we need it last year? No. Can you be sure we'll need it next year? No. How much did it cost? Millions of pounds. Why are you wasting millions of pounds, Minister? So it's not just boring. It's not just that you're taking responsibility if it doesn't work after the event. Ex ante, you are the wastrel. You're the person who's investing in something we don't need, that has no purpose. And the more of it there is, the worse the situation is. Imagine it. Uh, uh, some luckless Secretary of State for Health or uh, Chief Medical Officer or... Uh, permanent secretary in the Department of Health and Social Care or whatever, uh, decides to invest in, uh, what would it be, a billion masks, Tw 20 masks per person, roughly speaking, in Britain. They have to build a huge set of warehouses for a billion masks. I, I was the luckless inheritor from a grandfather of an enormous number of rotting coconuts. So I can tell you, th these things occupy large amounts of space, so you need huge areas. Uh, when are these going to be used? No idea, maybe never. Why are you investing all this time? And then, incidentally, you've got to air condition the place so they don't become decrepit. You've got to go in and replace them when they look as if they nevertheless are getting decrepit. You've got to guard them. You've got to... It goes on and on. All completely uselessly, quote. So resilience is a phenomenally difficult uphill task to introduce into any rational, optimizing political system. And it doesn't matter whether it's democratic competition or the competition within 
more autocratic kinds of government, in either situation, uh, uh, resilience almost always will lose out against either defensive works where you can go before the Public Accounts Committee and say, look, we, we have built a foolproof, ironclad system of preventing whoever it may be from penetrating our defences. And it, well, I can tell you more. Day by day, it is preventing, th it is, incidentally, that's true, our cyber defences, preventing thousands of attacks from all over the world. This is not a waste. This is a wonder. This is a high-tech wonder. The low-tech factory or uh, warehouse containing billions of masks, never used, useless. Resilience is politically toxic. Defense against, that's telling me I must stop in a moment. Uh, 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 defense is politically sexy. And that's why resilience loses out. So there are misconceptions that need to be addressed and there's a doctrine that needs to be adopted and that doctrine probably won't be adopted because it's very counterintuitive for politics. And therefore, I hope that your centre will do something to change this and make people realise that resilience actually matters. Thank you. So I've got uh, three or four questions. Um, online, and at least one in the room, Akarathas. Could you just use the red microphone? Um, and then we'll come to those in, in a second. Um, I, one thing that was, was been interesting about the previous session, which you were not able to, to hear, was that there was this um, imaginary disgust um, of having a... I'm just going to read out um, Ray Taylor's summary of it. The, the global emergency intellectual surge capacity... Um, I accidentally called this the bat phone to, to global catastrophic risk experts. But that idea that you have um, kind of a ready group of, of experts who have thought through these, these large catastrophes ready as a, as a capacity to support policymakers. Um, and Ray asked, um, as a former politician and civil servant, what would be the second best host organisation, apart from CESA, um, um, which most governments would trust to call? Um, to host our imaginary um, surge capacity by the bat phone? Well, uh, um, I mean, I, th I, th I think it's a, it's a very good um, question, but it goes a bit wider. Um, uh, part, part of the problem here, for the very reasons I, I've been illustrating, is that um, it, it, it's very, very difficult for... Uh, uh, the ordinary organs of, of any state to focus on these issues and to establish any uh, organisation that they sponsor for the purposes you're describing or for the purposes I was describing. It doesn't matter. Anything in this area of uh, dealing with risks ex post, if I can put it that way, is very unsexy uh, for the reasons I was exposing. And therefore what happens is nothing. just doesn't get done. And even... Uh, horizon scanning and trying to uh, uh, work out in advance what's about to hit you in order to be prepared ex post is very unsexy. I, I give you a, a direct experience of my own. I set up in the Cabinet Office uh, before I left a little unit based on my experience with Ebola, which was designed, tiny group of people, two full-time equivalent, to scan the horizon continuously for viruses heading our way. Along came a, a series of problems for government. In that case, it happened to be Brexit, but it's not because it was nothing to do with Brexit itself. It's just government got busy. And uh, this little unit, somebody said, well, we no viruses head our way. Why are we worried about this? And they were taken off the job and put onto Brexit planning, which is really happening. And uh, that typically happens. So if my first point is, if you want to do something like this, you need it not to be in government. Because if it's in government, it will quickly be used for something, quote, more important. Um, uh, however, the paradox is it also can't be something completely outside government. Because if it's completely outside government, ministers and officials typically will not pay very much attention to it. So the, 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 the essay question actually is, how do you create something that isn't in government, isn't of government, but is sufficiently associated with the state so that government, i.e. ministers and officials, cannot ignore it. And, and that's the reason why I strongly advocate 
the creation of a specific office independent of government, like the Climate Change Committee does for climate or the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England does to control interest rates, uh, that is established by Act of Parliament in our system or by constitutional devices in other systems uh, and is uh, uh, empowered with the ability to spend public funds to do nothing other than deal ex ante with resilience and ex post with catastrophes and um, uh, to advise and which can uh, not only call on public funds of its own permanently by statute but also can uh, call government to account uh, uh, as the Climate Change Committee does with the uh, budgets that it sets for carbon every few years. So you need an institution that is somewhere between uh, uh, the, the, the core governmental activity and non-government. It needs to be in a, in a space of its own uh, and, and endowed with a power, but not be subject to being derailed by governmental necessities day to day. Thank you. And that, that feels very in line with some of the conversations we had this morning. My, my second question from online is um, one from a couple that David Woods has put through, but I thought I'd pick out um, this one. So do you accept that some risks would be so catastrophic that no amount of prearranged resilience would offer much help? The doesn't society's response to risk need to involve active prevention as well as building resilience? Oh, it certainly needs to involve active prevention. Um, active prevention is very, very important. Um, and um, I mean, that, that's the reason for concerning ourselves about reducing carbon emissions, for example. That is an active effort to prevent some of the worst of the catastrophe from occurring. Um, uh, uh, and it's a very good thing. And as I was saying, I very much agree with the decision that's been made by governments around the world to build very elaborate cyber defences. Very sensible thing to do. My point is, having done that is not a reason, having spent all this money trying to prevent these risks from occurring, is not a reason for sitting back and congratulating yourself. It's a reason for getting on and re recognising that nevertheless, probably some things you didn't like at all and are very, very nasty will happen that you haven't been able to defend against, either because you didn't predict them or because they've got through the defences and therefore you need fallbacks. And if you're designing your fallbacks so they deal with impacts, not causes, uh, and they, they therefore don't depend on predicting which kind of disease, they don't depend on knowing why it is that the satellites have stopped working or the grid's been falling over, or whatever it may be, they just say, if any of these nasty things happen, we've got some fallback solutions that will allow us to carry on for a while while we try and put these things right, that's a very sensible attitude and should be added, not, not substitute for, but added to investing in defence against these things. There is a group, finally, of risks so large, maybe I should say in some cases certainties, so near certainties, so large, that there's no point in trying to uh, uh, prevent them. Uh, I, I, I'm not aware of anybody who knows how to stop the sun absorbing the earth. Um, and we just have to reconcile ourselves to a certain point some far distant and the descendants of ours will have to go somewhere else if they want to go on surviving. Um, so you, you shouldn't worry about the risks you really can't do anything about. Um, you should worry about the risks where you can provide defences and you should worry about the possibility that those defences will be penetrated or that you've predicted the wrong risks and have fallback solutions. Um, and the final question from line, online was, it's, I think it's Sam Smith, although it says Smith Sam. Um, so, he, he's read your book, Apocalypse How. Thank you. <laughs> and he, he said you offered um, reverence to the Civil Contingencies Secretariat in that book. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, and if you were writing your book again now, what would you change? Um, I think he's asking, would you still offer the same reverence? Oh, yes, I think the Civil Contingencies Secretariat is, is a, a very useful device. Um, uh, I, I don't think it, uh, my view of that has changed at all. Uh, but it's, uh, it's not the whole answer. Uh, and, and, and part of the reason it's not the whole answer is it's a very tiny organization inside a very large thing, uh, which, you know, this is Russian doll, which is inside a very large society, uh, which is inside a very large world. Uh, and so uh, it's just one element of, of the mechanics. Um, and, and I do think that there is an institution missing, which is the institution we were discussing just a moment ago, which stands between government and society and invigilates government and focuses just on the question of 
ex ante uh, prevention and uh, ex post management uh, of, uh, of risks as they materialise. Um, I'm going to give Paul the privilege of the first question and then we'll come to Thomas. Uh, Paul Coingram from Caesar here. Um, I, uh, sometimes the stupid questions are stupid, so I'm going to make myself look stupid. But you finished your talk by saying that defence was sexy and attracted a lot of support. Uh, and my question is why, uh, given that defence is itself a preparation for a, a crisis um, that... that if the logic uh, fit, fitted, would also be problematic in terms of preparing for. And the answer is probably obvious to everyone in the room. But then in that case, what are the lessons we can take from the fact that defence is, is, is sexy to then apply it to other catastrophic risks which could then become sexy? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean defence in the sense of the Ministry of Defence. Okay. I meant defence in the sense of def defensive mechanisms that are designed to prevent risks from occurring as opposed to resilience fallback mechanisms that are designed to deal with risks once they've materialized so yes i mean defense the ministry of defense is highly sexy and that's because uh they have taken trouble over some millennia to make it so so you know they've got uh, They've got bands and uh, their fancy uniforms and marching and uh, generals who have uh, the ear of the prime minister in the newspapers and, 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 and. Uh, this is called in unflattering but more accurate terms the military industrial complex. And, you know, that's very sexy. And there's a huge colossal vested interest in it. And incidentally, three quarters or eight tenths of it or something completely useless as defense. It's actually giving us the capacity to project power. I haven't noticed any particular example of why it's useful for us to project power, but and nevertheless, we seek to project power, and that's, uh, you know, people believe in this. Uh, 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 so, yes, that's very sexy. No, but it's even it's sexy to have um, uh, the National Cyber Centre. So, well, I didn't have any difficulty with some other ministers in uh, persuading my colleagues in the National Security Council to authorise large expenditures to improve our cyber defences. Um, uh, we were even able, alongside other governments before and since, to persuade both the public and politicians and uh, officials to spend very large amounts of money building flood defences. So, uh, which are not, you know, neither of those come under the Ministry of Defence, but they're very sexy because you can go and see them. They're huge things. Uh, they're defending you against floods. The floods happen every so often. You can see the water doesn't come in. Uh, you, you know, get your, get your OBE. Um, uh, um, but uh, this pile of masks or the pile of salt or uh, maps being distributed, uh, this seems infantile. Um, that's what's not sexy. Lots of questions coming. Um, back of that audience was first and then we'll come down. Thomas Meyer from the Center for Apocalyptic and Post-Apocalyptic Studies in Heidelberg. Um, many thanks for your really illuminating talk, which made completely clear to me that this thinking in terms of maximization, optimization, effectiveness is a major problem of itself when it comes to prepare us against catastrophes. May I take from your talk that this thinking in terms of capitalism is itself a major catastrophic risk for the, for the world. And if so, would you have any low-tech advice how to prepare us against that risk and how to make us more resilient against that kind of thinking? Uh, I think my short answer is no. Uh, it isn't, uh, I mean, uh, it, you're, you're absolutely right. The, the, this, is, um, this is sort of baked into capitalism. It's unfortunately also baked into other uh, political ideologies. It doesn't, it li I literally don't think it matters for this purpose whether we're talking about um, uh, uh, states that are organized on entirely uh, command bases or states that are organized on entirely free market bases. In, in practice, there is no state that is either totally one or totally the other, but you know, it, at, even at the extremes, it's the same. I, I've been astonished uh, dealing with counterparts in China and Russia and the, exactly the same problems uh, uh, that, that, that you observe here. And, and you know, 
just in case you don't think that, 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 that either of those are sufficiently uncapitalist, um, uh, um, uh, one of the worst examples of, of this phenomenon was, was uh, Cuba under, under Castro. We were absolutely uninterested in any kind of, of resilience. Maximizing efficiency was, was absolutely the forefront. So the, the, the problem is, it, it, the, although the systems are different, and you, know, you can argue forever and a day about which are better and worse for other purposes, they have the same basic incentive that some set of people have to be pleased with something that you're doing that is providing them with something in public choice theory terms, which gives them an advance in their careers. And that always comes from optimizing the efficiencies and doing things which are sexy, not from worrying about the resilience to unknown or, or ex post events that you hadn't predicted or hadn't adequately defended against. And uh, I don't think there is any way of overcoming that uh, that's sort of theoretical or cultural or that would really solve the problem, the, the un underlying problem you're talking about. I think what you have to do is to create institutions, which I was talking about just now, a, a non-governmental institute, who, where it becomes their rationale, their raison d'etre, that they are concerned with these things, and therefore their careers are advanced by just concerning themselves with this. And I, mean, I think the Climate Change Committee is a very interesting example of that, when we, when we collectively, British politicians, we, we got together cross party, we invented the idea of the Climate Change Committee and climate budgets and so on in the Climate Act. And uh, uh, I remember that I happened to be doing that job in the opposition at the time, and uh, I spent a large amount of time with David Miliband, who was then my uh, opposite number, who was the, the uh, Environment Secretary at the time, and we, we, we worked out that if we can make this completely uh, ironclad that every political party signed up to it and put it into statute and created an organization with no other purpose that was uh, uh, that you couldn't take funds away from uh, then it would develop its own raison d'etre and people who got into it would see it as their mark of success that they had managed to make the public and ministers and officials and the newspapers and so on, really interested in the question, how do we mitigate the climate change risk? And I think that's worked. I think, I, I don't mean it's succeeded in every respect it needs to succeed in by any means, but it has at least made a very big difference. So I think the only way you can attack this is to create an institution where the incentives are completely different, either from the market incentives or from the incentives within bureaucracies and, and, and ministries in any country. And, and give it its own rationale, which is just to deal with this. Thank you. Um, we're actually running close to time, but you'll be staying around hopefully with us maybe for a little bit afterwards. Uh, um, a minute or two, yes. Yeah, okay, <laughs> all right. Um, so Lara's question um, might have to be the last for now. Um, and maybe Tom, if I'm feeling nice. <laughs> um, hi, Oliver. Um, Lara from um, one of the researchers here at CESA. Um, so for the last couple of days, we've kind of talked about um, uh, this kind of gap between, um, and certainly in, in, here in Caesar, we, we've got a project where we're, we're learning the lessons from COVID and we use this terminology of implementation failures. It's not a failure of understanding the actions of what to do. We know that we should stop our masks, but the action isn't done. And I guess, um, and we've seen that time and time again, and often you get this effect of short terms of office that, that you know, dissolve certain actions of the office before them. And so um, a lot of the onus that we've talked about this week is on us as academics about communicating our science and getting policymakers to take that seriously. But I'm wondering um, how we can incentivize policymakers to uh, try to take what we are communicating more seriously too. How can we bridge that gap between information and action, which, you know, for example, we saw um, I mentioned in my talk yesterday about the recommendations from Operation Cygnus, which were very clear about how to prepare for the pandemic, and nothing was actioned. How can we bridge that gap to incentivise uh, politicians? Um, I'm, I don't want to sound like a, um, a broken record, but I, I, um, I don't think you can. I don't, I don't think there's some magic elixir which will persuade governments to pay attention to these things uh, in any serious way, unless there is a body they cannot avoid paying attention to, which, you know, in all its august splendor, Cambridge University ain't, <laughs> can be ignored. Um, all the universities can be ignored. Um, uh, a body which is set up by Parliament that hauls ministers in front of it and 
has statutory powers and duties and spends public money cannot be ignored. And that would give you a point of contact. Then, then you've got a group of people who are sitting there whose life is to try to make sure that things are done rather than not done, and who are going to report to Parliament that they aren't being done if they aren't being done. Um, uh, and, and then it's just a question of information. And there you can be a real help and others like you. But at the moment, the problem, as you say, is not one of lack of information, not that there aren't places government could go to find these things out. It's not even that it doesn't find it out for itself. As you say, the, 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 in preparing for the pandemic flu, these things were observed but not done. Why? Because there was an urgent need to spend money on curing people of cancer. And there was not a body that said, hold on, uh, we have the power to say, even if you are wanting to spend money on saving people from cancer, you have to pile up the masks. And until there, there is such a body that has that incentive and isn't bound by the same imperatives that the Department of Health and Social Care and the Number 10 and the Treasury and the political parties, and including opposition parties, are all bound by. They're all in the same unconscious conspiracy to be concerned about the hip replacements and the uh, curing of cancer. And they just aren't going to invest in the masks until and unless they're forced to by something which is inside enough to make them, but outside enough to have this as its remit. Thank you. Um, join me in thanking Oliver. You can, Tom, ask your question afterwards. <laughs> um, thank you again. <laughs>